that sort of uh, accolade when I'm about to speak. <laughs> but um, it's really good to be here. I, I just recently uh, returned from a preaching and teaching trip to Germany and I was talking to uh, Roger about this and just wanted to mention something because it's really an appetite to what we're going to look at this morning. Uh, we were looking with the charismatic Methodist Church in Germany, hallelujah, wow. and uh, about 350 present at their annual congress, uh, and, and I was so blown away because they're so hungry, uh, and the people were, I mean, just really lovely, beautiful Christian men and women who were hungry for more of the Lord, and hungry for teaching, hung, hungry for Bible truth, Amen. and um, it was the most wonderful time to be with them, but the theme was really about the end times, it was about the work of the Spirit, being Spirit-filled in the end times. How are we ready? What should we do? How do we prepare ourselves? How do we live in a manner which is worthy of our calling? And, uh, and it was very challenging. And one of the things I wanted to say to you about today, and the things that you'll hear from me, and certainly I guess from Richard, is that there were many situations, um, things that I spoke about, which they had not heard of before in terms of the sort of geopolitical and financial uh, situation which is very much the end times picture and how Satan is already moving things into place. And uh, I, on the one hand, I'm delighted about that because it means the Lord is coming soon, hallelujah. Amen. Uh, on the other hand, I'm quite sort of distracted by it because um, I, I really feel called to a sort of warfare in prayer uh, to really see the enemy beaten down in as many strongholds as possible. Uh, that, that good men and women who have not got hold of the truth of Jesus Christ, crucified, risen, ascended, ever-living Lord, who will come again, need to hear so that they can become born again. And they can know him when he comes, and they'll be known by him when he comes too. Praise the Lord. And uh, on Thursday this week, on Remembrance uh, Day, when we were in London for another conference, um, this time for another part of Europe, for the Czech Republic and Slovakia. And uh, we had the privilege of being able to join many outside uh, Westminster Abbey uh, for the two minutes of silence and to take part in that moment when uh, all the different regiments and battalions and groups put their crosses for those who've been lost in the recent wars, particularly uh, that are so well publicised, put those crosses in the ground. And people, there were crowds. It was wonderful to see young people as well as people, if I dare say, our age, uh, standing absolutely not just silent, but actually overawed. Mm. Overawed about what people have done, ordinary people in giving their lives that we could actually have a freedom and a freedom in a Christian so-called country to actually discover the love of God in Jesus Christ. Yes. And uh, it was a most powerful time. And uh, that reminded me too of another context that we find ourselves in again and again. Today we could say it really raises the ante, the temperature goes up. Because in the midst of all of those uh, poignant signs of death in battle for freedom and for right, there is that pointer to life, life everlasting mm. in Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. And, and even if the people didn't really know that, I felt the Holy Spirit moving in the crowds that were all around Westminster Abbey, the Houses of Parliament, even the other side of the road, outside the Queen Elizabeth Centre where we were, there were crowds outside just stood absolutely moved mm. by those moments. And I believe the Holy Spirit was speaking to many people. Amen. And uh, in our conference, we, uh, we were, I, I don't know how to describe it, we were just overwhelmed, I suppose, by the goodness of God uh, uh, in His grace. For us as a nation who have <coughs> so let down, been unfaithful to our own promises and words, been so greedy and everything, with the nations of Europe. I, I'm not talking particularly about France and Germany. I'm talking about Czechoslovakia, as was, who've been a friend of this country, who married, I mean, their princess married Richard II. I mean, we have a long line of relationship, of 
really good feelings towards each other and wanting to help. And yet, we sold out the <coughs> Czech Republic, we sold out Czechoslovakia to Hitler. And with a month of Chamberlain's uh, appeasement, within a month, 300,000 Jews had been rounded up in the Czech, Czechoslovakia and taken off to the, to the camps for extermination. That was the first sign then. But, but even so, you know, something like 46 million pounds then of gold, their gold reserves. Montague Norman, uh, a very high level Freemason, uh, uh, one of the members of the One World, Cliveden set uh, in this country and, and around the world, gave that gold to Hitler to fund his war effort. And I had been preaching and teaching a lot in the Czech Republic and in Slovakia. And, and the grace of these people towards us is wonderful. And they've been through some things. They were absolutely flattened by Germany in the war. Absolutely flattened. They were flattened by communism. Who sold them out but the Freemasons? Roosevelt, 33rd degree, President of the United States of America, in his Yalta agreement, which he thought he could trust Stalin, despite being told, never trust the man whatsoever. But the deal had already been done by two Grand Europa Lodge members, the two forerunners of Czechoslovakia, the president and like the first minister. And they agreed to hand over the Czech Czechoslovakia to Russia and many other parts around of what is Eastern Europe. They agreed in a deal before Roosevelt could even get near. A Churchill, as you know, if you've read your history, was excluded from all of this. And they did the deal that Stalin could have the Russian troops first into Berlin. That he could have his pick. And who was behind all that? But the one-worlders. From Cecil Rhodes, Ruskin, whom the university at, at Oxford, one college is named after him, but who actually founded that. Cecil Rhodes, from whom the Rhodes Scholarship came into being in Oxford. And many influential and important people have been groomed there on Rhodes Scholarships, including Bill Clinton. Yeah. <clears throat> who become the new one world government brokers, the power brokers in this, in this world. The ones who are manipulating our existence day by day. Bilderberg has met two weeks before the G20, they always do. They decide the agenda and they decide the outcomes, so what good is it sending politicians? <laughs> the deal's done. <coughs> and that deal is part of Satan's end times plan. And much of what we're going to talk about today uh, will relate to that. So I'm just giving you that as a context. I want to say to you that that on Thursday, Joan and I were just, we were blessed, we were just overwhelmed by what we've done as a nation when we've been blind to see the games that are being played politically, financially, socially, mm. through the age of the Enlightenment, through the, the, the reason and us becoming God, what we think, who we are. And all of that is totally and utterly against <coughs> Scripture. Mm. And so we're here not because it's a, a good idea, although it is a good idea to come together, always is for Christian brothers and sisters Amen. to dwell together in harmony, because there God Amen. releases the blessing, doesn't Amen. he? Amen. And he's releasing the blessing today, and I just feel the presence of God so powerfully. But I'm overcome as well, a part of me wants to weep. Because so many people are so blind, and in Germany, after my first talk, this one, which was slightly different, and the opening session as I preached, <coughs> about 15 of them decided they would skip their, their workshop on Friday to come to the one I was doing on the end times to be ready. Because nobody's been telling them. 
Mm. Nobody believes it. Mm. Their pastors don't. The church doesn't. Mm. And they want to know. And I guess that's why many of you are here. So this is very serious. But praise God. God's plan is Amen. already in place. Amen. Amen. And it's the best. Amen. But it doesn't allow us to sit and do nothing. <coughs> What's the saying? <coughs> when good men do nothing, evil prospers. Yes, mm. truth. Okay? So this is a wake-up call, church. Mm. For all of us. Yeah. Me included. Okay. Are we ready for the last days is the title of this particular session. And I want to begin, in a way, by a sort of personal anecdote uh, against me, in a way. Because as we sang, and thank you, Lorraine and Cathy, for such beautiful worship. Yeah, yeah. But, but as we sang, uh, the Lord reminded me of my wedding day to Pam, my first wife. Um, I was 23, she was 20. And my aunties uh, came, most of my uncles had died, I was from a very big family, and they came to our house, to the, to the Methodist manse, because my dad was a minister, to congregate as the family, to have one last look at this poor man, you know, <laughs> who had put on the chains of marriage. And uh, uh, they couldn't find me. And this was about three quarters of an hour before the service was due to take place nearby. And I was actually underneath my car. I'd just drained the sump and was <laughs> cleaning some small. Because I didn't want it to break down when we were going up on our honeymoon to the Lake District. And they thought I was really super cool and laid back. But I wasn't. I was desperate. And more importantly, I was very unready. And I have to tell you, my mother was disgusted with me. The state of my hands and nails when I went to the church. <laughs> it just reminded me. Uh, it's very easy to find yourself doing something else and have a different priority mm. when actually God's called us to have just one. Yes. Yeah. You know, and I told them in Germany, and this is the second one, I guess, this is the last one. I got to Germany, I flew very early in the morning from, from uh, Luton Airport. And uh, I got, I'd got up about four o'clock and in the semi-darkness I got dressed. You know, this is a real excuse. <laughs> <laughs> when I got to Germany and was picked up and then I was sort of straight on after lunch to, for the opening session and with horror I realised I got odd socks on <laughs> <laughs> so I confessed to start and I didn't think they would understand I thought their humour was different to ours but actually they rode about there and it sort of gave us a bond but I said you know but isn't that it you know I just again was improperly dressed and that's very much part of what God's calling us to be. He's not just ready, focused, but properly dressed. Mm -hmm. Amen. Yeah? Okay. So let's, uh, let's look at this. <coughs> Hang on. Can I just go back? Let's wind, wind the thing. I'll wind it. Okay. The ritual will save me from... That's it. Lovely. Okay. I read this um, actually a year ago, as you can see, October 09. I picked it up on a, an article I was reading from a conference in Baltimore in the USA. Time is running out and eternity is rushing in. And that's the title that we gave to this, this day today. And it struck me as just neatly, if we wanted a sound bite, which we don't always want, but it sums up what this is about. Time is running out and eternity is rushing in. So I want to say that in a sense, a fire alarm is actually ringing uh, for the church. We should hear and respond. Uh, people tell me of times when their companies or their organisations have fire alarm practices. And uh, not everybody uh, jumps up and goes straight out to the meeting place. Some hang about and tidy up or want to sit there and say, well, it's only a, only a practice, so I'm not going to go. <laughs> but actually, we can't say that, because the consequences of saying, well, I'm not going to bother because it's only a practice, would be catastrophic for us. So I want to say that there are things which, I think, for us, remind us of where we are. 
And I want to talk about the sort of things that we should be seeing that will warn us of what to expect. The things that we should be reading into more and more to actually say, a fire alarm's ringing. Am I ready? Am I dressed? You know? So let's look at the economic disasters which befall us at the moment. They're all around, aren't they? And I want to say that for me, that's perhaps more, it's more subtle and more powerful than the wars. Do you understand? Because yeah. when, we, when Jesus talks about rumours of wars and wars, they're only birth pains. Mm -hmm. They're not the real deal. Mm -hmm. Okay? As bad as they are, and as, and, and as much as we <coughs> lament and are pained by what's happening in Afghanistan and what happened in Iraq, and what surely will happen somewhere else before very long, the real <laughs> destruction is being done subtly. Mm -hmm. Yes. Because of the controls, because we're not a party to it, we have not elected these people, because already our lives are being dictated, everything about us is known, and because uh, money will have no value except the value that these people give to it at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. And so, <coughs> economic disaster, think, what would be the most effective weapon of the Muslim extremists and Al-Qaeda, Hezbollah, Hamas, and all of those groups? that are dedicated to the overthrow of Israel and to the death of all Christians, latest fatwa issued online and publicly by Al-Qaeda, we are all fair game for killing. Mm -hmm. what's, the most, what's the most effective way of doing down the West? It's financially. Why? Because who is our God? Our God is finance mm -hmm. and power. Mm -hmm. After 9-11, it was, there were many articles, very serious articles, which have since been sort of squashed, Suggesting that much of the money, the billions which was available to Bin Laden and others, was actually being used to, to massage and manipulate our stock markets, to buy into companies because of the freedom we give them to do so, to start to control uh, the main areas of industry <coughs> and commerce and politics. So that at the drop of a hat, they can pull the plug. Mm -hmm. yeah. And when the plug is pulled, who suffers? We do. So it, it, it's easy to blame the banks, but then the banks are part of this whole cartel of yes. evil, really. Yeah. Yeah. So economic disasters, the Middle East conflict, for us as Christians, surely we're going to say that if we're not looking to Israel and looking to the Middle East and reading our Bible and pleading with God to show us what is happening, to understand the signs, mm -hmm. then we're not going to be ready. Time is certainly short. And if you read the factual accounts, not the BBC accounts, not the Guardian's accounts, but, but those factual accounts which come from those on the ground and from the Jews, the Messianic Jews and others who are really looking at and, and giving facts, not just opinions, not just emotional responses, then you find that it's actually the most frightening scenario mm -hmm. there could be. Mm -hmm. Because the funding of, of terrorism is actually the funding of the annihilation of Israel mm. and of the Christians. Yeah. And it's dressed up as many other things and people will come and say, peace, peace, but there is no peace, there will be no peace. Mm. The only peace that comes is knowing Jesus Christ when Amen. things change and we Amen. become changed. Amen. Amen. And there can be no peace between us and, and, and Muslims and those other people because they don't want the same peace that we want. Because they don't worship the same God. Yeah. And because I would say that, and because I would say here, and, and, and even onto a video which they could watch, and say there is only one God and his name is Jesus. Amen. 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 And unless you know Jesus, then I am so sorry for you, as Muslims. Because there is no heaven for you. But if you come to accept him as your Lord and Saviour, and you do know such a lot about him, Mm. and accept him as Lord and Saviour, then your future is assured and you will be ready. Amen. Yes. But I dare to say that even though, even though, now the United Nations has passed a resolution which gives them the right now to, to, to have me thrown in, in jail and silenced for speaking out about the Lord Jesus Christ. Mm. Because the UN is part of this same group. Mm -hmm. <coughs> 
So I want to say, you know, economic disasters, Middle East conflict, oil and gas supply um, uh, uh, arguments. I mean, our, our resources, I mean, under globalization, you know, the, the whole theme of this is sold as big. Isn't it good that we have oil, so we'll give you some oil, we'll sell it to you, but we'll make it available to you. Isn't that nice? <laughs> and, and you're running out of oil, we've got loads of oil, we've got just yeah. barrels of it. So why don't we do a deal with you? You buy from us exclusively, and we'll look after you. Mm. My dad used to say we weren't born yesterday, but I think most of our politicians were. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and because what's going on is manipulation, and, and, and the, the deals that are done behind the scenes are not the ones relating to gas and oil, mm -hmm. but they're about political and economic power that control. Because when the pipelines are shut off to Europe, Europe has to plead and get on its knee to Russia and anybody else who's supplying. Mm -hmm. yeah. And that means probably accepting conditions which relate to how they see things from an atheistic point of view, from a very humanistic point of view, from a very anti-Christian point of view. And the same applies if we enter into deals with, with Muslim countries who are rich in oil. So we've got to read the, into these, and it's not, it will be sold always as it's good for the world, it's good for trade, it's good for us. Only last year we, we switched our gas and electric supply. Like many others, we switched back mm -hmm. to British gas. Mm -hmm. And British gas made a pledge. Yesterday they renounced the pledge. Mm -hmm. And, and my understanding of the situation is, well, it's because of the cost of wholesale gas, which we buy. But Centrica, which is part of, which owns British gas, are the ones that drill it and find it and then sell it. They're in a cartel. And the, and, and the, the elderly person living on their own that can hardly make ends meet now, what do they do? It's done without any regard for feeling, for, for a respect, and any, any sort of theology about... Uh, the worth of a human being in God's sight, made in his image. Any understanding and doctrine of God is missing. These are all done from a different perspective. So we need to understand that and not to get up and go and wreck Tory HQ, that's, but actually to pray into and against those things and to ask God for wisdom so that the whole church can come to understand and then can stand and say no. We take our stand. We put on the armour of God. And, and if that means that in a way we lose our lives for the sake of the coming of Christ soon, mm. then hallelujah. Yes. Amen. So, mm. but apart from that breakdown of family life, and, and many of you, and, and Richard will have done it in his, previously, I, as, a, as a Methodist minister and a pastor, and I still happens that we are involved with families whose, whose children are suffered, the little girls, often underage, <laughs> pregnant. It's just a regular thing, and in this part of the country, believe it or not, the, the, the underage pregnancy rate is tremendously high. We, and, and it's not because, it, of course it's because of sex, but it's actually because of the lack of love, lack of self-worth. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and they're so misguided. We've got the highest rates of just about everything in the whole of Europe and almost the world now. You know, we lead the world on, on, on gutter living, mm. seems to me. Mm. We've got such a responsibility because on our watch this has happened. Uh, and on our watch, it seems to me, this, this sewer, an open sewer, has come out of Europe uh, into this country and then from America and the Far East uh, of stuff which is just turning the kids... Mm lives upside down uh, and, and addictive substances not just having to go at drugs as such but all the things that help them to enter into another world for a short time just to get out of this world mm -hmm. uh, and who's made this world so bad and so we only have to look at the breakdown of family life the lack of longevity of marriages of commitment it's not where we're at and it's so sad and we just think, well, that's against what Scripture teaches, what Jesus himself said. It's what God ordained and planned. Mm -hmm. 
And then I've talked about wars and threats of wars, increasing violence in society. We see that now it's just open. It's open war, really, in some of the estates. I mean, you, people don't go out. They don't look at anybody else. You avert your eyes because if you look the wrong way, you're likely to get a knife between your lips. Mm. I mean, it, it, and carrying, carrying firearms is much more prevalent, as we see with these killings of young people. Cycle by killings. Used to be drive by, didn't it? Yeah. So, so there's so many things going on that when you actually stand back and take an overview from the news, you think, well, hang on a minute. This, didn't, this wasn't like this when I grew up. It was such a rarity, and everybody was absolutely stunned and horrified. Now, we don't even bother. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. On the big estates in London, people they just carry on as normal. Well, that shouldn't be. So we don't have to look at these signs. We can't go into them in any more detail, but you know what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. The increase <coughs> in violence in society. And in these days, the, the, sort of the man of lawlessness has raised his head. Mm -hmm. And there is, a, there is a sense in which they are bold to do this now. Mm -hmm. Yes. You know, when our local policemen used to come down the street, we were so well behaved. <laughs> now they don't, they don't bat, if, if you get a local policeman, but, I mean, that's a different argument. But there is not the respect. Society itself has imploded. And we hold on to norms and values which are not society's norms and values today. So read the sign. What does that say? And of course, that's all part of moral decline in society and the rise of lawlessness. So, we've got to teach various things about all this. And, and one of the things is really to be ready, obviously. Uh, watching for the flood, I've called it. Uh, sort of know where the life belt is. I, I, love, the, I love the sort of airline uh, safety videos these days. The poor crew hardly get a chance to do anything except. <laughs> well, that's it but it's all so neatly done and that Monarch Airlines is the best one I've seen so far uh, Lufthansa's second uh, very swish and everything else but what it's all about is, is to know where your life, where your life belt is mm -hmm. to know what the, what the procedure is in the event of mm -hmm. and there's a sense in which for me that's what God is saying I've given you my word mm -hmm. I'm showing you what it is so get ready know how to be ready and uh, it's also uh, whether we should be sensible or silly. I mean, you can look at the two road cones blocking off, or you can look at the man running. They're just symbols to try and indicate these points. Sensible or silly. I, I was drawn a few years ago um, to Matthew 25 uh, and the parable of the ten virgins. And I kept reading it and praying. and. And, and I felt then very positively God speaking to me about, about this passage that this was his word to the church for these last days. That we really should be ready. And uh, it, it's really important that we are. Um, so know where your life belt is. Are you going to be sensible or silly? Sensible like the five wise virgins who have kept their lamps trimmed. And surely, I mean, for me, surely, this is also about spirit-filled living. It's about being led by, guided by, filled by, empowered by, anointed by the Amen. Holy Spirit Amen. for the glory Amen. of God. Amen. 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 And then we're assured of coming into the, to the wedding feast, being there with the Lamb. But those who don't, and this is what was breaking my heart at the time, was that many people in the churches I was looking after, I felt weren't at that stage. They were the silly ones. Uh, that, like we feel we can dip our toe in. Well, one week, yeah, well, okay, we'll, we'll be charismatic this week. And next week, let's go back to liturgy, just to be said. You know, and then in the week, we can sort of, we just do what we want, sort of thing. But this, this, that's not even an option. We're not Sunday observance society. We're 24 7 children of God, aren't we? Amen. And, and we're 24 7 to be filled by the presence of the <coughs> Holy God of Israel who wants to reside in us, who wants to empower us and lead us and fill us and give us wisdom and understanding and release the very gifts that, that his son exemplified in his ministry upon earth so that we could do all that he did and even greater things, amen? amen. Yes. So that the world can see that as we speak the word of God, it is demonstrated by the power of the Holy Spirit. And I said that in Germany, I'm not interested 
in a, in a sense, in coming to services and they're like, oh, what is he saying? This man is a heretic. I say, well, I don't want to hear anymore. I want to actually see and experience the proof, if you like. That's what I want people to see, the presence of God. Because in my ministry, there's nothing like a miracle to get people talking about God in the streets. Yes. There's nothing like a miracle that draws people into the assembly of God's people to hear the truth and to find Jesus Christ as Saviour. There's nothing like a miracle that excites the person who's been a sort of uh, almost Christian in Mr. Wesley's words. And suddenly to stand up and be bold on the bus going into town to do the shopping and to tell everybody how God's just healed their leg, how the brace has come off or they can now hear perfectly or whatever it is. And to say, you know, this is God, Jesus Christ did this and people sit uncomfortably and think you shouldn't speak like this on the, on the bus or the train or whatever. But, but you can't stop them because they're fired up. And I can remember when I was converted, when I came to the Lord and was filled with the Holy Spirit, it couldn't stop me. My wife says she can't now, but I, you know, you want to talk about Jesus all the time. And she says you can talk the legs off a hind donkey. Uh, the hind legs of a donkey, get it right. The hind legs of a donkey. I say yes, provided we're talking about the things of God. Why do we want to stop? There's only one subject really, isn't there? At the end of the day, everything is wrapped up in him Amen. and in his arms. Amen. And I can't live my life apart from him. And he says, don't, because if you do, you wither on the vine. Mm -hmm. And if you wither on the vine, well, guess what? Click, 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 burn. Mm. That seemed to me a warning. And that was spoken, I think, to the, wasn't it to the disciples, those who followed him and loved him? Wasn't that the teaching to those who claimed to be his? Mm -hmm. Hallelujah. <laughs> Save us, Lord. So, signs of the time. Then the, read the signs of the end. You know, Matthew 24, compare uh, with Elijah in 1 Kings 19, looking for the rain he prayed for. You know, just think about what Jesus is saying. Some things are just birth pains, but other things are going to be the real deal. And then I, I look at the, where in the text, he says that there'll be two men in a field. One is taken. I would say, Lord, what does that mean? Why one and not the other? Two, men will be, two women will be grinding. One is taken and one is not. Why and then straight on he goes into this parable of the ten virgins and five go in and five don't. So that's the same proportion mathematically. And maybe, maybe it's because we think we're okay and actually we're not. Hmm. So it raises all sorts of deeper questions for us about our faith and how we walk the walk of faith and, and, and how truly close we are walking with God in our reading of the scriptures, our devotion to him, and in our witness in the power of the Spirit. I've met many people who have come to me at the end of services and sermons and talked about um, Scripture. And they said, oh, you missed this Scripture and that Scripture. And the Scripture says this. And they've quoted it pretty well exactly as it, as it is written. But many of them have had no gentleness, no grace, and no love. And I'm thinking, well, what profits a man? to know things if he doesn't know the Lord. Mm. I mean, the Muslims know about Jesus. Their problem is they don't know him. Mm. Truth. And our job is to make him know. Amen. And we just read these signs uh, and understand what he's saying. So there are three keys. And these, if you were making notes, would be the things. And, that, and he'd say there are some limited number of copies of notes on the thing at the break, you could pick them off the table where the books are. Um, and for Roger, I'd be quite happy to get some more to for tomorrow night, because many of your people are here. Um, the three keys, you must be ready, Matthew 24, 44. You must keep watch. You must, in that, that sense, be filled with the Spirit. You must be sensible. You must look at the signs, Matthew 25, 1 to 13. And don't be deceived. Jesus said, didn't he, my kingdom is not of this world. Everything around us, politically, socially, is all about a different world. It's about this world, mm -hmm. the gods of this world, yes. who are running riot at the moment, while the Lord just sits there waiting for his moment, because the victory is his. Amen. 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 And John 18.36 will give you something else to look at on that. But there are some dangers, so I mean, it's very easy sometimes to do the good things, and, and we want we love bless ups, don't we? Um, but uh, but actually, then to, to not look at 
the dangers. What what's God saying? Because He's so even-handed, you know. So if on the one hand you don't do this, then maybe you should expect this. It doesn't hit us hard. It just lays the truth before us that hits us hard enough. And and it seems to me that that one of the things that Jesus is teaching in this whole thing is about being a worthless <laughs> servant. Now, I don't, this is not to be heavy about this, but I think there's a, there are simple tests, aren't there, to say, have I lived my life today in a manner worthy of my calling? Have I taken every opportunity to make Jesus Christ known? Have I taken every opportunity to pray for people or to speak a word of prophecy or a word of blessing? Have I stood fast to the truth? Have I stood fast in any dispute or argument with people standing for Jesus Christ? If the answer is well, no, not really, then maybe we need to just readdress. And at the start of every day, like my, but my son when he was 16, just before he died, I mean, his opening prayer, which stunned me, and I, I wrote about it a lot in the book, was, what's today, Dad? You know, just for a brief moment, I thought he was asking me, what's today, Dad? But he wasn't. He explained to me. He wanted to know from God, who should I pray for? But my friends are not to be lost. All my school chums, all the ones that I've knocked about with, who I've just had such a great time with. You know, I just want to pray. What's today? What do we, who do we pray for? Give me their names. Tell me what to pray for. And he was even moving in the spirit in those last few days of his life. He couldn't see because of the tumours behind his eyes. He was often slumped down in bed, very tired. But he was so alive, he couldn't not be lifted up. Mm. I, was, I know God helped me as his dad, as James's dad, through all that. And gave me such strength and inspiration because I, 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 I felt I spoke to and heard from Jesus as my son spoke. Maybe that's how it had to be. Because mm. I might not have listened terribly well otherwise. But know what you're doing. Ask Father at the beginning of each day, you know, what is today? What do you want me to do? My Bible tells me that he's prepared in advance for me mm. the good works to do. Yes. So maybe the question is, Father, what are the good works today? Mm. I had a crazy group of women. It's not that women are crazy, you understand? <laughs> I had this crazy group of women. They were all intercessors. We had all these groups, and I had ten different intercessory prayer groups in one of my churches. And we were in revival. And they used to come to me, and they'd bang on my study door quite early in the morning. I'd say, oh, no. And it, they'd come in, and they'd had a word of prophecy again, you know, in their, in their groups. We've got to give you this word of prophecy. And, and it would be a word of knowledge. The Lord's shown us this person in the village and this is what's going on and you've got to go and see them. Okay? And you know, more often than not that person became a Christian. They renounced everything or the marriage was healed or whatever it was and the children were healed. But we, we were led by, by the way that the Lord showed us what he planned for us to do, if we were obedient. And then one day they said to me, and do you know what we're praying now? So I said, go on. They said, we pray for the good works out in the street that you can actually minister and there'll be miracles in the street. I said, okay. <laughs> and so my wife and I prayed, okay, Lord, show what happened. The very first day I went down into, into Frodsham, as the, the, the nearest town was called, I saw a man who was so badly crippled, struggling to get back into his car to drive off. And the Lord said, go on then. <laughs> and so I, I said to him, look, I'm a Christian minister. God's just told me I must pray for you. Would you allow me the privilege of praying for you? They said, yes. And, and I said, well, just try and sit down in the seat and put your legs out. And we prayed, you know, he received such a, a, a fire in his legs and such a strength. He didn't sort of cast his crutches off, but he got up and was so much stronger walking around. And I just said to him, you know, can we pray some more? He said, no, that's lovely, thank you very much. <laughs> and, and got in the car and drove off. But I felt that I'd, I'd, I'd be obedient. Do you know, when I was a, a local preacher in the Methodist church, and I was preaching about healing, and uh, I was preaching in one of, one of our churches, and we were a very typical Methodist circuit. We were middle of the road. Uh, only just evangelical when it suited us, you know? And uh, I was preaching about healing, so... Uh, as I started to preach about the gift of healing, this woman, it's only women, anyway, this woman, she, 
She started coughing and splotting. She was in such a bad state. And the Lord said, go on then. You're preaching about it, now do it. <laughs> so I said, we're going to stop the service. Well, it's like you could see people trying to get under the pews. <laughs> no, seriously. Nobody had ever done that. They had been going 120 years or whatever. Anyway, I went down from the pulpit. I said, now, I want you all to, those near, lay hands on her. And we're going to rebuke this spirit in the name of, because trying to disrupt the, the service and cause this woman some physical problems. So we rebuked it and spoke healing in the name of Jesus. She didn't make another month. All the service. She was better. Hallelujah. Amen. But God spoke to me about doing the stuff. I suppose in society we should put your money where your mouth is. But isn't that a test every day? Have I, have I actually been... He might not ask you to do any of that. Don't think you've got to look for that every day. But be ready for whatever it is. Amen. And be obedient. Uh, I know the gifts that you've given have got to be used. None of us like the idea of being a worthless servant and cast out. I haven't got many teeth to grind, but I mean, you know, just don't practice. <laughs> Get there slowly. Okay. And, and thirdly, gaining the world and losing your soul. If we're so wedded to the theories, the dogmas, the political sort of promises which are being made, then... And we live our lives according to, to the way society is moving, then we're likely to have got our priorities wrong. And if they are wrong, then we're in danger. Okay, let's move on to the next thing. So, in a sense, a sort of how do we how do we sort of do this? It's about personal holiness, sonship, I call it, lifestyle choices. Lifestyle action and lifestyle stamina. Um, th this very much to me is about who we are in him. And I, I told some of you, and I, for me it's, it's constantly on my mind. Because when I was um, 11, 12, my mum and dad felt it better that that I went away to a Methodist boarding school. My little brother went to the preparatory school and me hated every minute of it. Um, I wasn't so keen in the first few years, but I was much happier later on, particularly when I excelled at sport and managed to do all right academically. But Dad used to tell, Mum never took me. Dad always took me to school on the first day of term. And we'd lug the heavy trunk down, I'd come by train, there was a station right at the side of the school, carry this great big trunk up, and my tuck box. I would have left the trunk behind just to bring the tuck box, realize, but <laughs> dragged them down the long driveway into the school playground. And he would never come across the playground into the buildings themselves where we would dump the tuck boxes and the things just to go and register that we'd arrived. <coughs> but he stopped by the tennis courts and he said the same thing to me every time. He said, Andrew, remember who you are. And remember whose you are. Do you know, I thought it was one of the, the most naff thing I'd ever heard. I thought, well, why did he know? I, I'm, I'm his son. I know, I'm Andrew. In all honesty, uh, and, um, it took me till I was about 30, about 29, something like that, before I realised truly what he was saying. What is my identity? My identity is in Jesus Christ. Amen. I'm a son of God. Mm -hmm. That's who I am. Mm -hmm. and, and, and in a sense, I've been given this new identity by the Spirit of God at work within me. Mm -hmm. That I look more like Jesus Christ. There's a long way to go. But that's who I am to know. Mm -hmm. That's who I am to be. And that's the same, I believe, for every single one of us. Mm -hmm. Amen. So, it's about lifestyle choices about deciding uh, how we're going to dress. Not in the way of clothing, although the, the metaphors are there in Scripture, and they're great for preaching at weddings. About putting on Christ, <coughs> not putting on the old self or the way the world wants to dress. But actually, because God isn't interested in the clothing, the outer. He's interested in the heart. Mm -hmm. 
This is actually about dressing the heart. It's about making a, a lifestyle choice of how we live, <clears throat> our priorities. It's a great Wesleyan thing. The whole holiness uh, movements were born out of Methodism. And most of the big revivals were influenced by the, the holiness preachers of the day. Because those are the transformed lives. And one of, <clears throat> when Wesley talks about the marks of a Christian, he just really wants to talk about the state of the heart. That this is all summed up in one word, love. Do you love God with all of your being? Do you love your neighbour as yourself? Do you love your enemy? Do you love one another as Jesus has loved us? And the answer, truthfully, is no, not always. Some of them, but not all. Sometimes all of them, but not much. It's about holiness. God says, be holy, for I am holy. And I've got some news for you. You can't be holy, neither can I, without him. Mm -hmm. Amen. He's the one who causes us to become holy ground, mm -hmm. to become a holy offering acceptable to him. So that in a sense, we can see him. We will be known as his. Maybe it's like the leaven in the dough. Maybe it's like the stock in the big stew or the, or the casserole. Whatever, however you want to visualise it, however it works for you. Being holy changes the whole context and the tapestry of your life and the people in your life. Mm -hmm. Challenges and changes and offers a complete new beginning to those around. Because holiness has what everybody's after. Love and faithfulness mm -hmm. and kindness and gentleness and self-control and long-suffering. You know? So when Paul talks about this love, he's talking about a love which actually is summed up in being holy. For I am holy. Because God exemplifies love completely. Mm -hmm. But it's about <clears throat> living that. And we don't. The truth is we're fallen. We are who we are. But with God's help we can do better every day. He's not after us perfect in that sense. He's after us wanting to be perfect. Mm -hmm. Wanting every day to be better. To serve him and love him and know him better. And to be what we should be for everybody else. So we practice sonship. And it's a telling thing when somebody says to me, Joe... I just see Jesus when I look at you. And when that's been said to me, I want to do what Peter did when he met Jesus. And Jesus called him to be a disciple and said, get away from me, I'm a sinful man. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Listen, I know what's in here. But actually what they're seeing is a work that God is doing mm -hmm. in me Amen. and in you. Amen. And that's beautiful to behold. Mm -hmm. Amen. And it's what they want and it's what they've been looking for. It's what their heart desires. And our job is to lead them to the one who will give it to them. Mm -hmm. And will so transform their lives that it's the most beautiful thing. And, and, and we should you know, put that into action. It's about being a witness. We are called to be witnesses of these things. Even, I believe, Paul, in talking to the Ephesian church, wants us to even be a witness uh, to the powers and principalities that we reveal the mystery of God. And I believe that is absolutely right. Because I, I look at that letter to the Ephesians very much from perspective of a spiritual warfare. I think mean, that's why, where he begins and it's where he finishes in chapter 6 with putting on the armour of God. Amen. Amen. And, and part, of, part of dealing with the context that we're in in these end times is actually our witness saving people, our witness making a difference, our witness pushing the darkness <coughs> back. Because the darkness has never extinguished the light. Amen. And in holiness we carry the light and we are the light of Christ. In our communities, in our homes, in our families. <coughs> I don't know about you, and it's not, it's not, it, I worked on building sites for many years. Because I was a charting quantity surveyor. <coughs> and one of the things that used to hurt me, and it did, still hurts me, I can't stand bad language. I can't stand blasphemy. I can't stand any of that. I don't like the modern languages because the use of, 
of non-English words, which are words which have come into current use and some have fortunately made it into the OED. But it hurts my spirit. Mm -hmm. And I remember working, working on a site in Leeds, uh, the firm I was helping at the time, we were doing a lot of work for Wimpy's. And, and very early on, the engineer that worked with me, involved in setting out all these roads and sewers and things, was such a, a beautiful Christian brother. He was really charismatic, you know, really born again, lovely guy. Uh, so we said, right, well, let's have Bible study at lunch times in the site cabins. Let's, let's, you know, start as we mean to go on. And he said, okay. So we started our Bible study and prayer time together in one of the cabins. I mean, you, you, you don't really want to go in some site cabins because they stink. But anyway, we, we were in the site cabin and full of muck and stuff. And, and within minutes, some of the, the sort of agents looking after various aspects of this huge job came in and said, oh, I'm a Catholic. Mm. Oh, I'm an Anglican. <laughs> Can we join you? And uh, then they said, well, of course, we haven't been for years. <laughs> I was married in the Methodist church, one said. So good for you. <laughs> <laughs> I want to say, did that make any difference? <laughs> <laughs> married in the sight of God might have been better. <laughs> you understand what I mean. But you know what happened? The swearing stopped on the side. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's unnecessary. We don't need those to use them as adjectives to actually say what is urgent, what is necessary, and where something is wrong. It doesn't need describing it that way. It's offensive. It's offensive to God. And if we're in the spirit, we feel that offence. But we're not to be offended. We've given up that right. So what we must do is actually show by our lifestyle and our holiness and our actions that actually it's not part of us, nor is it part of God, nor is it part of his kingdom. Hallelujah. There won't be bad language in heaven. Hallelujah. Amen. And then lifestyle st stamina. <clears throat> and those who trust in the Lord will renew their strength day by day, hour by hour, minute by minute. And we need that. Because when we come to things like this and we, we share, we talk, we pray, we're involved in a ministry to one another, we're giving out so much of ourselves in body, mind, spirit and heart. And we need to be refreshed. And, and, and that's why Paul says that... <clears throat> You know, we don't rely on the ways of this world, particularly on, on getting drunk or, or having those sort of things to, to, to spike us up and give us enthusiasm and energy. Instead, he says, you actually go on being, being filled Amen. with God himself, with the Holy Spirit. So, lifestyle stamina, and that gives way to personal victory despite all these situations around us. So, are you ready to pay the price? Are you ready to move the mountains and to really get into prayer to move the hand of God in these days? To understand what's going on. And most of all, and best of all, to magnify King Jesus. Amen. Amen. In everything we do and we are. Because that's what we're called, I think, more and more. It's, it's not that it never was this, it was always this. But I just think the context and the times have sharpened it and bring it to a sharp focus. And God speaks to us says, are you ready? Have you heard the alarm bell? Do you know where your life belt is? Are you ready to become holy? For real change life and lifestyle, to become a witness, to become a person who moves the hand of God in these last days, that speaks to the mountains that are in our society and move them out of the way, so that many can be ready for King Jesus when he comes again. Yeah? yeah? Amen. Shall we pray? Amen. Father, we just thank you so much. You are our God and you are our Father in heaven. You are our all, our hope, yes. our joy, our strength, our salvation, our righteousness, our peace. You're our comfort. You're our shelter. You're a strong tower. You are our Father, our God. There is only you. There is none other. And more than that, you have revealed yourself as Father, Son and Holy Spirit, one God, indivisible, the same forever and ever. In your image you made us, mm -hmm. and we bless you for that. Hallelujah. 
You are full of grace and truth and you dwelt among us and you are here now by your spirit. Amen, Lord. And as you gave the first disciples the privilege of seeing you in the flesh, so you've given us the privilege of seeing you in each other and by your spirit. Thank you, Lord. Preparing us for that day when we shall see you face to face. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. So our heart cry is, O oh God, Holy Spirit, mighty, mighty God of love, and grace. Move upon us now, Lord, we oh, pray. Lord. Yes. And the things that you've already been stirring us with in this first session, Lord, as you've spoken right into our situation and put your finger on the spot, Hallelujah. which is secret to other people but is known to you, mm. would you change us in those areas? Yes, mm. Lord. Please, Lord. Yeah. Would you open the ears of our heart and the ears of our spirit to hear the siren going off? Yes. Oh, would you give us, Lord, such a desire to be holy as you are holy? To be known as yours. Would you give us the boldness to set, be set apart, consecrated for you. Mm. That wherever we are is holy ground. Mm. Because we stand with you. Hallelujah. You always with us. Mm -hmm. So would you do that? And Lord would you enable us to be ready and hungry again for more and more of you. After the coffee break and this afternoon. Yes. We pray. Yes. In Jesus mighty name. Hallelujah. Amen. 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 Thank you. Amen. the last session but move it forward in a little bit more detail uh, particularly I want to to try and share some things with you about how we do live our lives and in a sense how the church should be as, as a practical uh, outworking so we've, we've looked at a, a, the basis uh, some biblical background uh, but now I want to try and root this down in, in, into the church and how we should be and uh, encourage you because you're all agents for change uh, in your churches and, and also in your friends who go to churches who, who don't even have any teaching on the end times, they have no um, <coughs> view perhaps about Israel or if they have it may not be the right one um, and so God's calling you to, to, to use your anointing in a way uh, which will change things for other people in the church. Uh, because I, I very much believe that uh, God hasn't changed his plan at all mm -hmm. about, about his body being the church Amen. and the church being the means by which the world should hear the gospel. Amen. Right. Yeah. Amen. Before I start, I want to just to share one or two things with you, uh, really about the sort of background. Now, these are not in any way, please don't think that I'm saying you need to read these at all because it's only if the Holy Spirit leads you. But um, the first thing that, that I saw some, a few years ago uh, was a, quite a large book. I haven't brought that one with me. Uh, it's, it's sort of well bigger than this one. Written by two journalists, uh, Booker and North, uh, called The Great Deception. And these are, these are top uh, flanking uh, reporters, investigative reporters, who spent about 10 years researching the whole business about Europe uh, in an effort to try and understand um, what was going on because they saw it from, from their perspective as reporters having met uh, European leaders at the time I mean going back into the sort of 70s as being a deception. Now they don't write from a Christian perspective Okay, this is just <coughs> intelligent people, if you like, good people who've got a set of moral standards and believe in freedom and democracy, seeing something which is the opposite of all that. And so they wrote this book called The Great Deception. And the book was prevented uh, on a number of occasions from being finally printed and eventually it did come out. And uh, they were under a great deal of pressure and threats against their life for the things that they got in it. Now that book does contain transcripts. Going back to the Second World War, uh, meetings between our civil servants and leaders of, of the Third Reich and France, agreeing the basic deal uh, for then uh, Europe as a trading uh, uh, area. Uh, and that's how it was to begin, but the, the blueprint was for a federal Europe. 
The money came from America, uh, and it came via the Dutch, um, and uh, it came from the Rockefeller Foundation. Uh, again, he links with the formation of Bilderberg and Freemasonry. In fact, just about everything you want to, you find their name somewhere on it. The Ford Foundation as well. Um, and of course, Rockefellers own the Federal Reserve Bank in America, so the control of America's money is in the hands of this other group anyway, whatever uh, the president might think. Um, so that was one book which, uh, in a sense, God, in a way, said, I want you to read to understand. And it's important that we try to get as much fact and evidence as we can, uh, rather than to react emotionally uh, or politically, probably worse still, uh, against some of the things. Then I was led to a book called The Principality and Power of Europe by Adrian Hilton, which unearthed, from a Christian point of view, uh, so much of, uh, if you like, the, the, the whole movement of Antichrist within Europe and how these things were being planned. Uh, Alan Franklin wrote, uh, a, 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 this is a very powerful book, EU, Final World Empire. <coughs> okay. And, and the trouble is, the more of these you read, the more you realise you don't know, <laughs> because all this stuff is secret. <laughs> but, but there are people who risk their lives, and there are a number of journalists in this country who followed Bilderberg since the 60s, um, and uh, they've been threatened and everything else, but they still write, but they, they, they are in contact with each other. They try to get to all the meetings, they know when they are, and they know where they are, um, but of course, Interesting enough, the security forces of each country are put at the disposal of the Bilderbergers to, to, to actually uh, protect them from uh, prying eyes and ears, um, which is a frightening thought. Uh, David Hathaway, who's a, a wonderful man of God in Europe and in, 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 in um, um, Russia, Babylon in Europe. Another perspective from uh, a Christian leader who's right in the thick of it, and whose ministry is right in Germany as well, where much of this sadly emanates from. This one, the Bilderberg Conspiracy, is one which has helped me understand more about this particular group and the Illuminati, who, who uh, as Roger would tell you, is uh, above this group. But it's all tied in with Freemasonry, the beginnings of uh, Rosicrucianism in, in Germany, and where the first lodges came over to this country. Um, and uh, the, the formation of, 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 a, of two distinct brands of Freemasonry. Well, they're, they're the same in their rituals, but they're different in their, um, their methodology. The Europa Grand Lodge, which is, um, sorry, the Orient Grand Lodge, which is Europe, the lodges in Europe, <coughs> they, everything they do is planned for revolution. So when you look at the history of Europe, the revolutions have been manipulated since the 16th century by these people. And in this country, you won't be surprised to know that our Grand Lodge, uh, the whole methodology is occult. Okay? And then uh, this one, I just read it because I saw the title. I, I, I'm, I'm not quite at the point of agreeing with this, but... Uh, it, it, it's, for me, it was necessary to read it. 2012, is this the end? And that, that many feel that looking at scripture and working it out from the birth of Israel as a nation again, that, that 2012, the year of the Olympics, but uh, Olympics will be in heaven and not down here. <laughs> um, in my, my previous circuit, we, we had the tremendous privilege of having invited speakers from all over the world to come. Uh, one of them is Canon Andrew White, um, who is the sort of vicar of St. George's Baghdad, where the Anglican Church put him out to grass because he wasn't, in their view, fit enough with Emmy to, do, to, to continue in this country. But he has done the most amazing, he's so respected around the world. And they can't get around him because he's just a man of God. 
Mm. And uh, every bit, they all try to manipulate him. But uh, he, even he now, has had to write and say this latest uh, wave of bombings and killings by Al Qaeda, uh, which has resulted in his congregation at St. George's, well over 500 members. When you think at the end of the war, there were about 30 in a bombed out building. Um, uh, 200 have, have left to go into adjoining some of, uh, I think it's Syria, but anyway, they've gone to another Christian Anglican church rather than stay in Iraq because they're so frightened, just frightened. And then, then uh, the beginning of this week, there was another attack on, an, on, on a Christian area with car bombs, Al Qaeda again. And so he, he said that, um, as far as he's concerned, he'd already decided that he was going to preach on present suffering and future glory from Romans. <laughs> so he did, uh, which helped a number of them to decide they'd stay for the time being. Um, but it is, it is very frightening, uh, the threat which is there from this uh, spirit of Islam and, uh, and from Al-Qaeda, who want to establish a worldwide caliphate, which runs in with some of these other things we're talking about, one world government. So, and, and of course, uh, having written that he, although he's got death threats galore and fatwas against him, he's staying. Bless his heart. Um, uh, you've just got to say, well, thank you, Lord, for people like Andrew. Yes. And, 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 and the Barnabas Fund this week has uh, sent out a circular if you, if you hear from them, Dr. Patrick Suduke, I think they, uh, he's um, an analyst, he's, he's excellent, and what he writes as a Christian is very factual, um, but exposes much of what is, Islam is, is trying to do. And uh, of course, Al-Qaeda now has issued a directive that Christians everywhere are legitimate targets for murder. Uh, we are infidels, that's <coughs> the teaching of <coughs> the, the, the extremists, and that includes some of the clerics in this country too, which is why we've got the bombers and others taking up arms when they hear this stuff. Um, Postmodern terrorism, um, interesting enough, in some recent essays and many published <coughs> books, uh, is linked very much to uh, Al Qaeda and. Uh, I was going to say the right wing, not extre extreme as such, but to to fundamentalist Islam. And um, the frightening thing is that in amongst all of what's going on, which takes our attention away, which is why I was trying to stress to you, you have to look at the signs and read. There are now um, a huge number, if I could find the number for you, of uh, Muslims now living in America. They are very close to becoming the biggest uh, uh, group. The Hispanics are the biggest group at the moment in America, but they will become the biggest voting group. So there's a, again this subtle revolution going on which will change the laws in America and we'll bring in more of the discrimination that the UN have already got against anybody that says anything about Islam. Um, and uh, are using worldwide terrorism as a means of destabilizing the world and frightening people. Um, I mean, I, I would say I collect these things, but I feel it's my duty under God mm. to, to read them in order that I can share things with you. I mentioned the UN. Human Rights Council issued this uh, resolution on the defamation of religions. And that sounds as if it might be fair, doesn't it? Religions plural, so that it protects us all, but actually it's not. It was brought by the, uh, by the, um, uh, pal uh, pa the Palestinian, no, sorry, by the Pakistanis on behalf of all the Muslim organizations. And basically what it is is to silence anybody that said anything about Islam. And that will be regarded as a crime. And, uh, and many people are saying it's just absolutely outrageous and it's a discrimination in the way. They claim we're discriminating against them, but actually this is the, and that's the lie that you get. That's what this human rights legislation in Europe is about, it's a lie. That's what political correctness is about, it's a lie. 
It's all, it's all coming from one place. Yeah. And it's all to soften us up and move us into a place where our lives are shaped and controlled by uh, these people. So, and then, as I said about Bilderberg, and the other thing which is quite interesting to read is um, the, 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 the established plan for Islam is world domination. And, and, and that's, that, theologically, that's where they believe, and, and that many, particularly in the Middle East, want to establish the worldwide caliphate. So does Al-Qaeda, obviously, and so does the president of Iran, and if you hear him talk about. And, and, and his latest speech at the UN was, was actually sounding very persuasive, until you realise what they're behind it. And, and, and the whole use of nuclear weapons and lies and, and being involved with other uh, countries like North Korea who would happily see the end of Israel tomorrow. Uh, it just makes us stop and think, say, well, actually, I've got lots of pieces here, Lord, mm -hmm. like a jigsaw. Mm -hmm. What's the future? <coughs> and so I believe God says, well, there's some more pieces yet. You don't see the full picture. But all you need to know is right in the middle of this is the coming of the Son of God. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. And, and if you, if you, uh, many of you are very involved supporting Israel, but I, I subscribe with my wife to reports from uh, Mayor's Israel, and I find these very helpful to, to understand the context in the Middle East, which I said to you before, and I want to repeat, if you, don't, if you don't have a biblical position about Israel and the importance of Israel to God's plan and purpose and his redemptive purpose for the world, then, then perhaps it's good to reread and just to pray about it. Um, and also, uh, the, the importance of the Temple Mount, the importance of the Mount of Olives, uh, to the return of Jesus. But the significance of Jerusalem uh, in this whole battle of the end times. Um, the deal that the Palestinians want for peace is that um, they, uh, all their um, uh, Arab brothers and sisters who are displaced, stateless, because they refuse to have them. Every Arab nation has refused to have all the ones that were displaced, if you like, or allegedly displaced by Israel expanding its territory and, and just building in places where there weren't Arabs to start with, by the way. But anyway, these displaced, the whole deal is that they, they must be brought back into Israel. And, and there are millions of them and that it would be a state then of Palestine. And of course then they would change the laws and you can imagine what the laws would be changed to do. Which is another reason that Israel won't kowtow to. So unless we understand, and then we ask the questions why Blair and Bush before him and now Obama go prancing around saying stuff which is just nonsense, errant nonsense, and it's against God, that, that this will, will not succeed. And Netanyahu, who's in May, it's such a very godly man, um, is, is prepared to risk all just to stand firm. So, just, I'm not going to use PowerPoint, I just want to summarise some things for you. I just want to pray again. Father, we're just uh, <coughs> attempting to, in a way, Lord, piece together this jigsaw. And uh, to understand the context, to understand what you have already said, because you said, I've already told you that these things will happen. Mm -hmm. So Lord, we pray that in this session, dear Holy Spirit, that you, you would take um, the, the things which I've outlined, which in themselves are, are, are demonic and negative, Lord, and just fit them where they need to be, mm -hmm. whilst we maintain that the centre of everything is Jesus Christ, Lord and Saviour, mm -hmm. The beginning and the end. Hallelujah. The life and joy of his people. That we, Lord, will continue to become even more ready in this session for his coming again, Lord, for the rapture of the saints. And then for their final coming when the new heaven and new earth will be ushered in after the great defeat and Satan is thrown into the abyss. So Father, thank you that we, we meet in victory. Mm -hmm. We meet because we're overcomers. 
Hallelujah. We're here because we love you. Yes. And we're here because you love us and you want us to be ready and you want to feed our minds and spirit and heart with the truth. Yes, Lord. So, Lord, do that, please. Anything that's not right, Lord, let it fall to the ground. Mm. And for those words, which are the words that you would speak, Lord, let them take root by Amen. your spirit. Yes. And bear fruit, we pray. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Lord. <coughs> So I'd like to, to begin again in a way by just sharing some things with you. Um, I was praying for a, a, a lady who her son asked me to go and pray for her. She's a very spirit-filled lady. Um, she got, she felt she was ostracised by the local Methodist church some years ago. So she doesn't attend church, but. She spends every day in the Word and praying and ministering to people. But um, I've prayed with her over a number of uh, years now, where various things have happened, and she's had the most extraordinary touches of God, miracles, you'd say, in her life. And she's just really, you can't stop her. Um, but she summoned me uh, through her son to come and pray because she had problems with her circulation so much so that the doctor had told her that the big toe on her right foot had, had, was, had had it, and would have to be amputated. And of course, being who she was, she said, I'm not having that. I stand on the word of God and on his promises. Send for Andrew. <laughs> <laughs> so my response usually is, well, why can't Roger French go? <laughs> <laughs> or anybody else. <laughs> but I went, as bid. And, and, and we, we have a time of praise and worship and testimony and the last time I prayed for her, she, had, uh, she was about to go to hospital again and the doctor, she was in such pain from her shoulder and her neck and they, they said something had been trapped, she's going to have to go in and manipulate it. And the doctor came just as I'd finished praying and she said, there you are, I'm healed, glory to God, a miracle. And the poor man just stood with his mouth wide open, he didn't know what to say. <laughs> But he had to agree when he checked her out that, that she was totally better. <laughs> anyway, so she says, right, pray for my toe. So she presented her foot to me and we prayed. <laughs> At which she jumped up and stopped her feet and then said, that's it, that's fine. And then she said, but I, I'll go and see him. I said, well, you must, you know what Jesus said, you go and let him declare you to be well. So she went to see him. He didn't come see her this time. He probably learned his lesson. But anyway, um, he went to see him and, and, and he checked and circulation's perfect. Oh, no no operation Lord. necessary. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. <laughs> and I was really blessed uh, in one of my churches uh, a couple of years ago because we, we'd been ministering to so many people and just God doing amazing things. And there was a really, just a smashing young lad, about seven years of age, and his mum had become become a Christian, then she, she got spirit-filled, she came to membership, and, and she was a nurse, and you know, like the whole family was just touched by what had happened to her, and he was coming into Sunday school, and you know, everything, and he was just like, so open, loving the Lord, it was just wonderful to see. Anyway, uh, we had a time of uh, testimony, after a, a miracles um, uh, sort of crusade we had, and uh, th this little boy came forward, and I could, he could just knock me over with a feather, and I love it when children come, <laughs> Because they've got no inhibitions, it's just innocent and it's just as it is. And he just comes running forward and he stands there with the microphone and he just said, <clears throat> um, I had, my foot was covered in verrucas and I couldn't go swimming and my friends used to make fun of me at school. And then I thought, well, why don't I ask Jesus? Mummy said, well, pray. So I prayed. So they went and now I can go swimming. And that was his testimony. <laughs> <laughs> and it's not about to come up and say, well, actually, what you need to know is... <laughs> and then she described the medical condition. And, and, and he had a number of verrucas on his foot. And, and he was in a bad state. He had them for, for a while, and, and the treatment wasn't working. But, but he prayed. This is what was interesting. He prayed in his own room and asked Jesus to heal him. I love it. And I think, you know, God is so good. Why did he do it? Because he sees faith are all around him. Because he sees the model which is in other people's lives. Because he believes that in this church family, 
They believe that God can do anything and nothing is impossible for him. Amen. 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 And, and um, we had a, a guy just two or three weeks ago, and it's not my church now, but um, his wife, a young wife, had just left him for another man and left him with the children. And the guy was understandably totally devastated. And whoever it is, man or woman, who was in that situation, it is it's just totally devastating. And, and, and lots of questions would go through your mind as it did here. So <coughs> how would he look after them? What would happen? They've got a mum. Does she seem to want to know them? And uh, he remembered his days at Sunday school as a boy. It's interesting. And he thought, well, I think I should go to church. So he came to the service. I don't know whether you were preaching then, and you would remember. But anyway, some, so not one of our own, but some visiting preacher was preaching. Was it you? Yeah. It was this man? And he wept all the way through. Yeah. Then he gave his life to the Lord at the end. Yeah. I just think, here's something so wonderful. Nobody else had sort of got at him, if you like. But now he's, he's just part of the fellowship and is being really encouraged uh, in his faith. And, and as a single dad. And it's just wonderful, isn't it? And, and when you go to preach somewhere and something like that happens, it's such a blessing, isn't it? Because, you know, God gives us the privilege through words of knowledge and other things to be able to minister directly to people you know perhaps partly why you're there. But then God does these other things just to remind you he's God. But in the context of God's people, where faith arises, where there is worship and God resides in the praise of his people, where they're obedient to the words of knowledge and everything else, then all these things happen. It's the normative, to be the normative experience of the people of God. Amen. And uh, that's really what I wanted to get to in this session. Uh, because that's, that's practical, isn't it? That's the practical outworking of who we are together. And in these last days, that's, that's even more important mm. for us. Mm. So I wanted to share, because I'm, I'm a sort of, a, in a way, been a minister in the Methodist Church, I went to a Methodist type of seminary. I, all my points begin with the same letter from the alphabet. <laughs> you know, that's really good. I was told you should have three. You know, there was three points in the conclusion. But then somebody said, you've never conformed to anything that they say, so I've got six. <laughs> <laughs> so I want you to understand this is a double blessing, okay? You would have had three, but now there's six. <laughs> okay? The first thing I want to say to you, and this is important, is persecution goes with the territory. Mm. I'm trying to understand Jesus teaching the Sermon on the Mount. And, and that he said that, that blessed are those who are persecuted, you know, for my sake, for the gospel. And in the context of verses 1 through 10, well, 4 through 10 particularly, I believe that, that it's the persecution then that also enables us to know that we are going to heaven. Mm. Why? Because he himself was persecuted. Because he endured far more than we would probably ever endure. Mm. Particularly, he endured the cross for us. But we're called also to be willing to endure being crucified mm -hmm. for our faith, for him, for his glory. To show that this isn't just something that we are sent to in our heads or think that it's a good feeling to have. It's just that we are <coughs> sold out for him. Mm -hmm. Because the good that comes out of this is beyond our Ken. Mm -hmm. I don't mean our brother Ken. I mean beyond <laughs> our Ken. <laughs> because, he's, because the word says, doesn't it, you know, Again in Ephesians, and uh, chapter 3, verse 20, 21, God is able to do abundantly more mm -hmm. than yes. all we could ever ask or imagine. <coughs> and I reckon that in this room there'd be an awful lot of asking if we added it all together, and loads of imaginings. Mm, Some yeah. of it not good, but there'd be a lot of imaginings. But God is able to do abundantly more than Amen. all of that. Amen. And that's done through the church. In verse 21, Paul would say that according to his power, Amen. which yes. is at work in us. Amen. So when the power is at work in us, as Roger, and Richard, and anybody else that preaches will know, you know, Joe, Stephen, you know that God does this stuff. 
and it's beyond what we could have imagined. Mm. Mm. But persecution, standing up for Jesus, being identified as a spirit-filled Christian, somebody whose nature is changed, they've got a different approach to life, a different goal than society, different moral standards, ethically prepared to act in a totally different way than our government, our businesses, and <coughs> our local authorities. That we could be persecuted for owning the name of Jesus mm -hmm. and saying no. Mm -hmm. Somebody once said to me, what's your problem? Is it the N or is it the no? No. It's just a simple word, but actually it gets you out of a lot of trouble. But saying no to the world's standards, saying no to their, not even theology, but no to this terrible spirit of Antichrist that, that we've got in, in, in leading lights, again, the Illuminati types in this country, uh, who dared to stand up, come out the woodwork when the Pope came to denounce Christian uh, religion, to denounce the Pope, to denounce anybody as being <coughs> intellectually inferior that dared to believe in some deity. Hmm. So Richard Dawkins and et al. <coughs> all came out of the woodwork, stuck their head above the parapet and showed where the spirit of atheism is. This sort of humanism, which pervades every area of our society. And if you dare to stand against it, you're, you're intellectually inferior, you're in trouble. And of course, now, for most of people who are still at work who, on weekly or monthly reviews and appraisals, you're being judged on everything that you do and you don't do, or if you don't fall into line and follow the procedures, and do all the things either the government or the firm are saying you should do, some of which would be ethically totally unacceptable or morally unacceptable, when you dare to say no, then you're likely to lose your job or you're certainly likely to be on, on, in line for a warning. <coughs> so there's a price to pay. A price to pay. Everyone who wants to live a godly life, says St. Paul to his son in the Lord Timothy, will be persecuted. I know lots of people, lovely people, who just say, well, no, you know, everybody's nice. You know, they're nice people. Well, they are, they're just misguided. And I'm entitled to say they're misguided. I, I can say to them, you're misguided. I mustn't say anything else to them that judges them, but just say, I think you're misguided. I don't like your theology, or I don't like what you're trying to do. I think Jesus' way is better. And really, it would be good if you found out for yourself. Mm. And expect to be persecuted. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I have to say, uh, in all sincerity, that, that some of the worst persecution I've had has been in the church. Yeah. <laughs> and and so, so one can only conclude, because it's not the people, our battle isn't with flesh and blood, is it? Mm. Yeah. Powers and principalities. Some are being... Deluded, deceived. Even the elect says the word will be deceived. So, so some will immediately challenge you, <coughs> stamp their feet. Well, if you stay in this church as pastor, I'm not staying in as a member. <laughs> Whatever it is they're going to say to you, they're going to do it anyway. So that's the first P. And, and Matthew 5.11 is when Jesus talks about that persecution. The second P is praise and communion. You know, and I'm not talking about being together in, in, in the sense of meetings. I, I just think learning to praise him. I think some of the best praise is done at the kitchen sink. And, and uh, I, I just think some of you women, it's just the most godly time uh, free of often interference from husbands perhaps and children but but a time for some people just to praise to speak out praise and just to say looking through the window 
maybe forgetting to wash the dishes, but just saying, Lord, yeah. thank you. Yeah, yeah. What I'm looking at is so beautiful. And you made it. Every little <clears> thing. <throat> I just want to give you praise and glory because you, know, you made me. And your word says I'm wonderfully and fearfully made. Amen. And I want to say thank you for that. <clears throat> and I'm going to stand on that truth today. My leg's feeling gammy. I've got a headache, but I'm standing on the word today. Lord. So, would you make that word true for me today? I'm wonderfully, fearfully made by Amen. you. And nothing is impossible for you. And it's amazing, by the time you've wiped the next dish, all that's gone. You know, and there's a, there's a sense of... I can remember Pam, my first wife, one of, one of her sort of life-turning moments, in a way, was being at the kitchen sink... And just praising the Lord, just telling him how wonderful he, he is. And saying, I just want to thank you for my, I want to thank you for my husband, my lovely children. I just thank you for life. I just thank you for being so, and she said, she just sort of turned, oh, that's right. She, she'd done the washing and she just turned and she thought, I'd better just uh, skin this fish ready for me on the knee. And she said, you're still praising, thanking Jesus. And she looked around and there he was right at the side of her. And he'd been there all the time and she hadn't noticed. <laughs> and she said, oh, it's you. <laughs> and she said, he didn't say anything, just smiled at her. And when he smiled at her, she lit up like the sunshine and just got a hold of her and done something inside out. And she felt just totally reassured and blessed and at one. I mean, it wasn't the, the last experience she had of seeing him, but I think many people sense the presence of God so powerfully. Whether it's the kitchen seat or the car, many of us in our busy lives, we put tapes on, we praise. Or we might have a teaching tape on and there are times when we just say, yes, Lord, thank you. You are. And I praise you. You are wonderful. Thank you, Lord. And in those moments, you can sense the presence of God. But together when we do what the Bible says, whether we're two or three, he's there in the middle. But, but praising together. I mean, again, Paul writing both to the Ephesians and to Timothy says, you know, we're just sharing fellowship, <coughs> prayer and praise. Whether we sing psalms or hymns or spiritual songs, just worship mm. God together. Let's bless him. And, and pray. Be a house of prayer. And remember the Lord's death by sharing the bread and wine are all the ways in which, in praise and communion, <coughs> we tell him we love him. We rejoice that we're his. And we say we're going all the way with you. And God makes his presence felt. Amen. Husbands and wives. That's why it's so great to pray together in the morning, pray together in the evening, and any other time you can. But if you're separated by work and family commitments and everything else, those times are precious. When in agreement, the two of you in the presence of God, who brings you together in that wonderful uh, knot of love and, and devotion and faithfulness, makes his presence felt and leads you in your prayers and gives you words of knowledge and answers your deepest yearnings for your family, for your friends, for the church, whatever it is. And those are times that are so blessed. Boy, you sleep well after an evening prayer session like that. Mm -hmm. And in the morning you're ready to go and take on the world. There was uh, Edwina Curry, a, a once conservative minister who went to work on an egg. But I want to say to you, <laughs> go, go to work on a time of prayer and praise. And the, and, and the world changed. One of my friends said to me, do you know, this has been like watching a telly, an old black and white telly, where, where it's, it's just been like a snowstorm. And, and, and the horizontal hold has been, you know, it's been gone and it's just going up and rolling around and you can't make anything out. It's all indistinct and it's not really worth looking at. And then there's that day you get a coloured telly, brand new. And it's just different. It's beautiful, clear. And suddenly you appreciate all there is. And those are the days, aren't they? You go to work and it's so clear. You could love your workmate who's been driving you up the wall. <laughs> you can bless the boss who's not paying you enough. You can be nice to your client who still hasn't signed that contract for a big deal. Whatever it is. Because you can hand it over to God. Amen. And you can take care of it. Third P is to pursue righteous living. You notice how God leaves it to us that it's there, it's ours, it's, it's like the most beautiful thing, but it's up to us 
Not just to want it. That's not enough. It has to drive into pursuing. Mm. This is mine. I want it. And I'm going to get it. Mm. Because you have given this to me. It's my inheritance. This life is what you have for me. And I want it. You said you came that I might have life and life in all its fullness. Amen. Amen. Father, I just feel it's not been fully abundant. And I don't want to be greedy, but I want the abundance, please. Mm. Because I know out of the overflow of your blessing, others will be blessed. Mm. I have got so much to give. I want to pursue this righteous living. I want to be right and holy before you. I want to be righteous in my demands of you and my demands of other people. I want to treat other people as, the, as I would like them to treat me. Mm. I want to use your measure, your economy, in, in a way in which I then live and deal with other people. I want to pursue this sort of living. And I just want to do it not because it's good for me, but because it glorifies you. Amen. Because, because my life is enriched by your presence, having free reign and rule in me, living this way, that... I don't need anything else. I'm not asking for anything else, except give me more that I might pursue this life and live it for your glory. Amen. And in the anointed power of your Holy Spirit, as your presence has unfettered access to every part of me, then whether I blow on somebody, or put a hand out towards them, or just speak the word, or even think it, you do it, that they might be healed, have a miracle, come to faith, that their life's changed, their family is blessed in some way. Because I've committed myself to living this way. Because that's the description I read about your kingdom. And the eternal kingdom says there's no more dying, no more sighing, no more crying. Hallelujah. Well, I'd like some of that now, please. Because your kingdom is here. You said your kingdom is at hand. So in the abundance, it's the abundance of not of earthly, human, fleshy things. It's the abundance of your Amen. kingdom Amen. and kingdom life, kingdom love, kingdom hope, kingdom Amen. blessings. And Paul says in Ephesians 1, doesn't he? Every blessing in the heavenly realms is ours. Amen. In a Christmas present? Amen. No. no. In a Marks and Spencer's two-for-one deal? No. no. <laughs> in Jesus Christ. Amen. And I mean him. For those he chose from the, before the world was created. Amen. That's just too awesome for words. I want to live in that. Amen. My friend said, why do you live like that? Because I was God's choice before the world began. Eh? I thought it was a big bang. Oh, forget it. That's delusion. Let me tell you the truth. Before the world was created by him, he chose me. I am a creation, a work of wonder by God for his glory. Hallelujah. Amen. You can be too. Amen. Pursue it. Live it, not by works, Amen. but naturally, but supernaturally. Mm -hmm. Hallelujah. Mm -hmm. And then we can move into the second three. Isn't this a blessing? You know, not just three points, but you have six. <laughs> I think this is so exciting. <laughs> I'd put some more work into this and find another three. <laughs> yes. Now, the fourth one is, is where we get to, I think it's just sort of the way that this builds, because then we begin to please God. Amen. You don't start by pleasing God. You start by wanting to please God, by pursuing the method, the way of pleasing God, by praising God, by making him a part of everything, by giving him thanks and glory for every single bit and enduring whatever is thrown at you. Then you please him. Amen. So Paul says, you know, don't, don't let your mind be fuddled and <clears throat> twisted and deceived by the ways of this world and its thinking. Which is what we've been talking about, all this stuff. Instead, let it be renewed by the knowledge of the love of God, by the power of the Holy Spirit at work in you. Different perspective, different sight. The far horizon comes into view. Hallelujah, eternal life. Jesus Christ, Lord and Saviour forever. Hallelujah. <clears throat> And such joy and peace and beauty. <coughs> Immortal bodies clothed in that new body. Oh, the horizon comes nearer. Praising, praising, praising comes even nearer. And whatever your sight is now, you can still see it. Because it's coming nearer all the time. And you give him thanks and praise. And you please him because your mind has been renewed. The horizon is very clear. You know what's coming. The way that you should act and be now is very clear. And the, what you're doing as a result of your life 
and your devotion and your praise and your worship and enduring persecution and still laughing and blessing those who do that to you is that you please him. How wonderful it will be. Not for man to say, well done, good and faithful servant, but for father to say, praise the Lord. Well done, good and faithful servant. Do you know I've been watching you all this time? When I first became a Methodist minister, I was invited to go and preach after in the second year, I think it was, at a, a village <coughs> in, in a nearby circuit where my father had been the superintendent minister for a number of years before he retired and then died. And he's a very close friend, some people who've been very good to him after my mum died. And I went and I met these people who I knew. And they said, well, we want you to do uh, both of the services, morning and evening services. <coughs> and I said, that's fine. And at the end of the day, at the end of the services, this farmer and his wife came and they said, you know, your dad would be just so pleased. He never stopped praying for you to hear what God was calling you to. That you give up all these other notions and you would just follow him and become a preacher of the gospel. I just wept. Because Dad never told me. And all those years I gave him a hard time and I used to argue with him theologically. <laughs> tell, him about, tell him about the church and why well, I wasn't going to do this and that. And I said to him, when I was 18, and to my mum, I will never be a Methodist minister for anybody. <laughs> <laughs> uh, in parenthesis, I am not going to be poor. That was my reason. So I probably just had to get out of jail clause there. <laughs> and they said he never stopped praying for you. To know what God's call was on your life. My dad knew when I was 18. I was something like 46 when I entered the ministry. Wow, I'd been like Mrs. Sinatra in the meantime. Doing it my way. <laughs> been a local preacher, a youth leader. Just loved the Lord, got into the ministry. But I thought I could do both. <clears throat> it's quite painful actually sometimes with a foot in both pants. It's like sitting on a very sharp fence. And when I told my wife the day that I, God really spoke to me very audibly, and I said, God's called me into the ministry, she said, what took you so long? <laughs> she said, we've all known for years. <laughs> so, so I stand before you as, as a man, that's a bad mark. Certainly as one who didn't listen for a long time, that's another bad mark. <laughs> who tried it my way, which is another bad mark. And I want to say, perhaps these years in ministry have been the happiest. I felt I'd come home. God had called me not just to be a preacher of the gospel, but to be the gospel. Do mm. you understand? Mm. What's good and pleasing to God? When we offer our whole being as a living sacrifice to him. And that's our spiritual act of worship. So don't worry if you don't like liturgy and some of the science <coughs> books. I don't think God does tell him much either. No. He prefers this other spiritual act of worship. Mm -hmm. And then we are in a position, it seems to me, more and more because it comes out of who we are and what we are and a living relationship with him mm -hmm. to proclaim the truth. Mm -hmm. It just makes such a difference, doesn't it? I don't really want to say anything that he isn't saying. I get it wrong, of course I do. But my model is Jesus. We didn't even want to do anything except what the Father did. Because that's the kingdom things. Kingdom action, kingdom plan. <coughs> but proclaiming the truth is all wrapped up in that because that's what it is. The Spirit of God, God himself, leads us into all truth because he is the truth. You know, however much we try to <coughs> untangle this thing, it comes back to the same thing, whether Jesus is the way, the truth, but this is true. Aletheia is, it's not, it's not man's 
a balance of probability <coughs> as a test of the evidence. It's not even beyond reasonable doubt. It's somewhere way, way above that. It's truth. And, the, and there is, you can't gainsay the truth. Truth has a way of being so powerful in its outworking. Mm. You speak the truth and it happens. Mm. You speak balance of probability and it, there's a probability it won't happen. Mm. <laughs> it just doesn't. Mm. You know, our legal system is supposed to be about truth. It's not. No. Don't be misguided. But God's is. Because he's truth. So proclaiming the truth which again Peter talks about in, in his letter 1 Peter 3.15 and Paul to, to say in 2 Timothy. And it's the calling that we have to preach the word in and out of season, to preach the word of truth, which is the word given to us to rebuke uh, in, in order to bring life and wholeness. Um, it's a word which has such a power. It's a word in action, truth. So the minute you speak it, you can't retract it. But it has a way of cleaving between bone and marrow, between soul and spirit. And setting the captive free. Healing the sick, raising the dead. And bringing mm. to very sharp focus and beauty the very person of Jesus Christ and his kingdom. Mm. We're not talking about particular evangelism or gifting, but the call to every one of us, in every time and place, to be prepared with gentleness and with respect, to give an answer to everybody who asks us for the reason that we have this hope. The reason we want to dance all day long and shout and praise and sing hallelujah. Because of Jesus. And remember this truth is God breathed. Amen. And, and I think I, I, I met a guy who'd just come back from Argentina and he'd been on the prayer mountains. He's the editor of, uh, of the Good News magazine in America for the Methodist Church. This guy's one of the best preachers I've ever ever heard preach and he came back and he's just his whole life had been turned around really before all the big meetings with Carlos and Anacondia and all these other people um, they, they, they would travel for miles in four before trucks out somewhere into the back bush desert almost but they'd end up on a mountain and they'd walk for hours and then in the very late hours of the night they'd arrive in a clearing amongst bushes and trees on the side of the mountain and, and they realise in the sort of not total gloom but they could see hundreds and thousands of people praying seeking God <coughs> seeking God for the salvation of the thousands and hundreds of thousands that would come to these meetings for, for the demonised to be set free mm. for the sick to be healed mm. and he said you know he looked around and he, 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 made, he made out what was going and, and the reason he could see was because the bushes were on fire. And he said he thought at first it was glowworms. Then he realised it wasn't. It was the leaves were, were on fire, but they weren't burning. And it lit enough everything for everybody to see. But it was a supernatural sign from God that God was present with them. They were on holy ground. And then when he came back to minister, he found that it, when he got near to anybody and breathed on them, just people went out in the spirit, miracles of healing happened. And we, I mean, it, it was funny in the most wonderful way, if you understand, it wasn't disrespectful, but it was just awesome watching this guy. I mean, all he could do was pop mints in his mouth and go, <laughs> so he didn't offend anybody, but, but it was the power. And I said, why? Because the word of God is God breathed. Thea Neustos, it's the power of God in action. You know, he breathes this word into action. And that's what he was doing. And, and there are times in my ministry where the same thing has happened. You can't do it when you want to do it, only when the Spirit of God does it. <laughs> but it's quite awesome what happens. Scripture is God breathed. Truth is God breathed. And equips God's people for every kind of good work. And my last P is to put into practice the kingdom, the kingdom Manifesto. I just love the passages. I've preached them again and again and again. You know, you think in Matthew 10. You think compared to what our politicians, whether it's global or local, 
and, and the EU and the, whatever they have as their manifesto or as their modus operandi or the health service with it, they are nothing compared to the kingdom manifesto. Hallelujah. It's very simple. Preach the truth. Raise the dead. Heal the sick. Drive out the evil spirits. Tell everybody the kingdom's at hand. And be blessed. Sort of. That's the deal. It's real. It's here. And it's for you to be part of. So, so when Matthew records that he sends them out on a training exercise, they come back astounded, don't they? Wow, even the demons obeyed us. Well, I saw heaven <coughs> fall from heaven. But don't we get excited about that. This is just how it is. Just be glad that your names are written in heaven. Amen. I don't think it was just for today. No. Every day. Because mm. every day he's the same. Do you know, there's a passage in my Bible that hasn't been cut out. It's amazing, isn't it? Because the liberal theologians have tried to cut this out. I think it's Hebrews 13 8, that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And forever. Yeah. Amen. 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 Put into practice the kingdom manifesto. We're talking about the reality of a spirit-filled life, the witness of the spirit in the proclamation of the word. We're living in the kingdom norms of anointing and the gifts for the glory of God and the revelation of his glory in us. Hallelujah. So what do you see? How prepared are you? Is it like walking through treacle? <laughs> the Holy Spirit will help you to worship the King mm. he'll give you what to do he'll equip you for every good work mm. and he will glorify Jesus Christ through your obedience mm. Jesus said this is how I know that you love me when you are obedient mm. and do what I have commanded Do you need to ask for the gifts or for a fresh anointing this morning? Do you need just to spend a bit of quiet time before God as he's been sifting out stuff that's no need to be in you to replace it with truth? Do you need help with a two-for-one deal for your eyes? Better than spec savers. <laughs> To refocus you on him, mm. his kingdom, at the same time seeing the context of these end times. It's better to know who the enemy is, because mm. God's equipped you with all you need to fight mm. and to overcome. Mm -hmm. Amen. Yes. The urgency of the hour means that the hour is now. So I want to encourage you to be bold. Bold in the way you dress. Don't get dressed in the dark. <laughs> That's the futility of our thinking. Get dressed in the light. Be children of the light. Be ready. Don't be discouraged. All around, God is on the moon. Amen. All around, amazing, wonderful things are happening. That's why I wanted to tell you about Germany. I want to tell you about my friends in Czechoslovakia. In, in the Czech Republic, I should say. There's a Methodist church there, which is just in revival. And it's just amazing <coughs> and wonderful. I gave them a prophecy from the Lord. After I preached in March, I spoke the prophecy out, but it wasn't recorded. So I had to pray and ask the Lord to give it me again, which he did, and I typed it up and sent it. And then the essence of it was that they got to, Isaiah 51, stretch out, lengthen the tent, you know, stretch out the tent poles, make room for more as the children of, of, of the her who hasn't had children than the one who has, says the Lord. And that this would be a place, not a church building, then not to rent somewhere else which was bigger, that was another Christian building. They got to get something that was totally and utterly huge, way out of anything they could imagine they would need. 
that there they would be ministry uh, to the poor, they would have, um, they'd have food, a food place for giving out food, clothing, they would have free treatment for people, they'd have proper youth work, uh, they would have uh, facilities for the uh, homeless to dwell there, and the word would be preached and God would bless and he would fill this great big barn. And when I saw them in August, they said, well, we received this from you, and we prayed about it, and we received it as the word of God. So, <clears throat> explain to us what it is that you think, what did you see? I said, I just saw this big building, like a big industrial building. I have no idea in your town, because I don't know the town, but it was near housing, and, and it was an empty building, but it had huge forecourts, loads for parking, and it had space to build extra onto it. And I just saw the, everything there in different ministries impacting the whole of this area. So we talked about it and prayed a bit more. And then after we finished talking to the elders about it, they said, we need to tell you something. And it was a real, real strange experience, like when you, for the men, you know, when your wife said, I need to tell you something. <laughs> but this was like that in the spirit, because they were actually talking about something that was being brought to birth. They said, actually, after we had the prophecy, we decided that we needed to go out and do something about it. So we've rented this 700-seater building like an old industrial unit. <laughs> and it's just across the road from our present building. So now we've converted that to just for youth and children's work. And an extra res uh, residential spaces for visiting preachers. And, and now we're seeing people coming every Sunday. So, so they said, how do you think we should go about this? I said, I don't believe you've asked me that question. You're already doing it. But what they were doing was being encouraged to be bold, to be in the light, and to live this out, and to go for it. And they planted two churches since in nearby towns, and their, their prayer, hope, is for the whole of the Czech Republic to return to God. Praise the Lord. Only God can do that. And in these last days, with the context of what I said to you about what's happened to the Czech, Czechoslovakia and the Czech Republic, it's just wonderful. Lovely, godly people. And the same in Slovakia. So I want to encourage you. Really encourage you. You're not on your own. There's a great cloud of witnesses, but there's a whole heap of people here on earth who are busy now going, going for it for the Lord. So be encouraged. Be spirit-filled in these last days. And work out your life in a way which really speaks who you are and who's you are to the glory of God yes. and if you'd, like, if you'd like prayer we've got time during lunch yeah, yeah, during lunch, yeah. During lunch, I'll stay here if you want to just talk about anything or have some prayer ministry please do God bless you, bless you.